wasn't like the rest of the boys his age. He was the youngest of five children, so he grew up with his nephews. Bernie and myself are about 12 years apart, so he must have been 18 years old at the time. That's the age where all my cousins would look at magazines, run amok, sneak around with booze and cigarettes, and their interests, cars and females. <laughs> their favorite hangout place was a tree house they all built on top of an Encinito tree. I thought it was everyone's favorite. While the boys used it for fun, my grandma had a different purpose. She would use its branches as weapons. For any one of us who misbehaved, my grandma would wave the branch back and forth, like a fairy waving her wand. And once it broke, it was off to the next branch. Bernie's interest were roaming the streets and digging through people's trash. I have to admit, for a six-year-old, the things he would find were pretty amazing. Besides the ordinary rubber bands and empty shoe boxes, he would come home with a couple cents, shiny screws that would be used around the house, old tires that he would turn into swings for me and later push me off of, and if he was really lucky, beautiful jewelry that he would share with my grandma. And when it came to girls, he wasn't like the rest of the fellas. The other boys flirted with girls. Fernie had a different vibe. It wasn't your ordinary, boy likes girl, now let's get freaky type of way. It was more like, can I help you with these groceries? Or, hey girls, wanna hang out? And our conversations were far from the ordinary. Oh my God, Mimi, what is your Barbie wearing? She looks Gucci. She has a beautiful, elegant dress, like Queen Elizabeth, while searching around the room for the best inauthentic vintage curtains you could victimize to turn into a dress. But ironically, conversations with the boys seem to be the best and the funniest. Hey guys, look at the stupid chicken, Bernie would yell, as he threw it in the dryer and spun it for fun, followed by him choking my aunt's featherless chicken, and my aunt dashing through the house as if she was an Olympic runner, because her featherless chicken was screaming at the top of its length throat, <laughs> and the commotion didn't even disturb me anymore. As soon as I heard the chicken and saw my aunt dashing through the house, I would just roll my eyes and pray for the chicken as it continued to play. <laughs> he always had a way of annoying the boys and entertaining him with their stupidity, always being the joke of the group and never seemed to mind. On the contrary, it almost seemed to satisfy him. Growing up in Mexico, everyone seemed to know Fernand. Lupe, the store owner from across the street. Everyone from church. Raul, the drug dealer next door, always trying to recruit him because he was the most vulnerable and all the damn Tijuana. He was known for being helpful and well-mannered. But he was also infamous for doing strange, bizarre, obnoxious things. One time, he took the neighbor's dresses, hanging from the clothesline as he drive. He put them on and strutted, using the middle of the street as his runway. <laughs> Nothing pleased him more than the sound of laughter all around, which would never last very long. Soon after, my grandma would hear the rackets. She would sprint out of the house, chasing him with her magical wand. <laughs> Not many people knew Bernie's past, and at that time, neither did he. My grandma adopted him at two months old, when he, his mother passed away from drug use. She never treated him differently when it came to love and affection, but discipline was a different story. She never had to discipline me or the other boys on petty things. Therefore, Bernie had it worse. But then again, he wasn't all there. The drug addiction Bernie's mom had was so severe. Throughout her nine months of pregnancy and all through her teenage years, she would binge on drugs. And 18 years later, we saw how it affected Bernie. Mentally. Not only that, but at 18 years old, I don't think he was ready to come out of the closet and admit he was gay, even though I'm sure all the adults knew. So all the bizarre things he did was his way of capturing everyone's attention, I think. Ten years later, after being forced to spend every vacation and holiday in Tijuana, I finally got fed up with Bernie's mischievous acts. I, was a, I wasn't a teenager, I was a teenager. Barbies and their fashion statements were not my worries anymore. I now had to worry about my own fashion statements. I also started seeing a less of Bernie. Then again, 
he was already disappearing. He wasn't torturing chickens anymore or helping me dress up my dolls. He wasn't pushing me off the swing or bringing back goodies. The treehouse was falling apart. Grandma stopped waving her wand. Everything was just so different. But there was a glow in Fernie's eye. Fernie's eyes. He met Mike, an old strange man. I'm not quite sure what he fell in love with. He had a couple strands of white hair on his scalp. Six foot two, blue eyes that were exaggerated with the magnifying lens on his glasses. And not to mention his wrinkled shirts that barely buttoned up. <laughs> I swear, if he took one big breath, those buttons would dislodge from his shirt. After Fernie left with Mike, we hadn't heard much from him. Only my grandma would keep in contact with him. Holidays were soon coming up, and I missed him in his spontaneous burst. That upcoming Christmas, our gathering started around five in the afternoon. Unfortunately, the gathering took place at my aunt's house. She's the type of human that lives for compliments. And if anyone tries to compete with her, or if she ever feels threatened by someone's presence, it's off with her head. The night looked like it was going to be chilly, with the clouds hovering over us. We were all indoors, staying warm around the fireplace, playing our traditional Mexican games, Loteria, Pirinola, and typical card games. We heard a knock at the door. As it opened, our eyes widened. It was Fernie. Look who we have here, my dear shouted. As always, Fernie made his fabulous entrance grasping everyone's attention with his permed blonde hair, his extremely large fur coat, his Stacy Adams shoes. He cheerfully greeted everyone, his excitement portrayed on his face. He sat down and automatically started playing with his nieces. Family and friends made disturbing comments while he played. Look who joined the party, it's Fred from Scooby-Doo, one guy hissed. No, 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 it's Bubbles from the Powerpuff Girls. Another added, I couldn't understand. We hadn't seen Fernie in four years. Why was he being dissed? Especially by friends and family. Maybe not everyone was excited as I was. He paid minimal attention as he continued playing with the girls. While Fernie helped the girls dress up their Barbies, like the good old days, my aunt demanded for him to immediately get up and stop playing with the girls. You're not a kid anymore. Get up. You're embarrassing me in front of my guest. Her bark was so loud. It had the room dead silent, with not even the sound of crickets chirping outside. I'll never forget the look of shame on his face. With tears in his eyes, in the most respectful way Grandma always taught us, he thanked her and sincerely apologized for any harm or disrespect he could have possibly and showed himself to the door. All the emotion bottled up, and what had just happened didn't allow him to go far. He found some steps right across the street, but of course, no one paid attention. As I sat in my chair, my heart raced and blood boiled at the thought of my own family member having to be alone on Christmas for playing with his own nieces, doing absolutely nothing wrong. My mind raged but I couldn't find the courage or anger to stand up for him, at least not in front of strangers. After all, that's what everyone seemed like that night. So instead, I snuck outside. That Christmas was a cold, long, windy night. It almost looked like the clouds above us wanted to cry with us. I found Bernie sitting on some steps. I tiptoed over to him. Even though we were sitting across the street, we could still hear all the rumbling inside the house. I couldn't find the words to comfort him, nor to apologize on behalf of those people. After a couple of minutes of silence, I almost wish we were at an air show where there are plenty of deafening plane engines going on. From where we were sitting, we heard everything. Who invited him? He's not even family. He doesn't belong here. He's so weird and obnoxious. And now he's even trying to come in here and play with my girls? Doesn't he know he's a grown man? <laughs> or should I say he's undecided? My aunt shouted. 
while others went along with this round. Clearly, he meant no harm. On the contrary, he was reminiscing on the days he would make outfits for my dolls. Fernie's eyes were full of confusion. Each tear that rolled down his cheek almost told a story. I then understood and realized he, fe he felt misplaced, unloved. And all those times the guy made fun of him, it really hurt him. He would laugh only to try to fit in, but deep down inside, he was broken. This reminded me of the tree branches my grandma would make us cut off the tree. Breaking the branches hurt the tree as well as us, but as we look back at the tree now, it's empty, scarred from every branch it's missing, just like Fernie. I still couldn't find the words to comfort him. I felt his pain. I hugged him and cried with him, but I knew what he heard was permanent. And when he finally stood up, I walked into his car.